Welcome to the Spring Fever Garden Forums, where we connect you, the gardener, with the experts at North Dakota State University. And my name is Tom Kolb. I'm an extension horticulturist in the Department of Plant Sciences. Tonight is the third of our four nights of forums. And our theme tonight is having a healthy environment. Let's get started. You know, it's a delicate balance between killing the harmful insects while also trying to protect the beneficial insects. And so here to provide us with some advice is Dr. Jan Canoto. Jan is the professor and extension entomologist at NDSU. For 23 years, she has provided statewide leadership for extension entomology, the North Dakota IPM, that is the Integrated Pest Management Program, as well as the NDSU Crop and Pest Report. Her outreach and research efforts focus on insect pests on crops, as well as the pollinators, bees, and butterflies in crops and gardens. So Jan, welcome to the forums. Hi, good evening, everyone. And I usually talk about the good insects, but tonight I'll be talking about the bad insects that attack our flower gardens. So, and one of the things I always emphasize in my program is Integrated Pest Management, IPM. And I'm sure most of you've heard of it, but it's a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools. And you can see the IPM basics fact sheet there. It's more for agriculture crops, but if you're interested, you can download it from the NDSU publication website. So we have several different things that we use in our IPM toolbox. Uh, pest identification is key, knowing whether it's a good insect or a bad insect. And then pest monitoring and knowing a little bit about its biology so you know when to go out and scout and how to look for it. And then we have economic thresholds and predictive models, but for flower gardening, we really don't use those very much. It's more aesthetic uh, thresholds because you may have a plant that's been in your family garden for a long time and maybe over 50 years and you wanna preserve that plant no matter what. So there's all the different strategies here that I mentioned earlier on, about IPM. At the top is the more preventative ones and more environmentally friendly. And on the bottom is the more toxic strategies and the ones that we have to use with more intervention. So the first step, identification. Uh, there's, if you haven't had an entomology graduate level class, you know, you may struggle a little bit with insect identification. But there's a lot of books out there that don't use taxonomic keys where you have to learn, uh, you know, what, what some of the languages that we use and taxonomic keys that are, is quite difficult. And this, these books use primarily pictures, so it's much easier to identify an insect. You just compare the pictures. And there's quite a few websites as well popping up that you can use. And of course, you can always send a picture to me or the NDSU Plant Diagnostic Lab. So I got 20 minutes. So I'm going, I just selected six insects and I'll go through these six, but there is a lot more. Um, but these are six that I've been having trouble with myself um, in my garden. Aphids, I'm sure we've all experienced aphids because they get on a lot of different plants. Uh, they can be all different colors, uh, black, gray, green, pink, red. Uh, so they're kind of colorful. Uh, they're very small, about an eighth of an inch or smaller, and they're soft bodied and pear shaped. And we generally uh, can tell it's an aphid by these cornicles or just tailpipes that produce, protrude out the back end of the aphid. And you may say winged or wingless aphids. 
the wingless ones are mainly used for migration when they're moving around, or if the crop or the plant is overcrowded, uh, they'll use wings and develop wings to move to an area that is less populated. So they do have rapid reproduction, it's called asexual reproduction, uh, parthenogenesis. So it's essentially all female aphids giving birth to only females. And those females mature in about seven days or less. And then they're ready to give birth to live young. So it's a telescoping population and it can increase rapidly. And that's why it's so important that you scout for aphids. Um, they can literally explode when the temperatures are 72 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And they also have piercing sucking mouth parts. So when they insert uh, and feed on the plant sap, they have to excrete all those proteins and, and other sugars they get from the plant. And they do that in the form of honeydew. And when there's high populations, your leaves can be very sticky. And then you might get black sooty mold growing on the honeydew. And then the ants actually protect aphids because they like to feed on the honeydew. So you may see a lot of ants on plants that have a lot of aphids. So aphids are uh, number one vectors of viruses. Um, and other diseases. And they can vector over 200 different viruses. And that's because of their feeding uh, mechanism and their mouth parts. You can see there the stylet kind of looks like a, a knife and they insert that right directly into the plant and the juices and feed on the phloem level. And that's why they're such good transmitters of uh, viruses. So that's a problem. And that's why you don't want a lot of aphids on your plants because the viruses can outright kill your plant. So when you look for uh, damaging symptoms, um, you, may, you might look for some yellowing or some puckering on the leaves or stunting. Um, and then you can also look for the black sooty mold, but that indicates fairly high levels if you're going to have the mold growing in the sticky substances, the honeydew. So if you catch them early, you can use just physical control with a strong force of water at a high pressure to try and wash them off. Part of the problem is they're on the undersides of the leaves typically. Um, so you do need to, you know, get to the underside of the leaf. Um, then I'm showing that for all the pests, you know, just some general use insecticides, and I didn't list all of them. There's quite, you know, the homeowner, he has quite a selection of trade names, uh, but not so many active ingredients. So I'm just listing the active ingredients here. And then biorationale insecticides include botanicals, soaps, and microbial. And this, these would be the more type of insecticide that's labeled for organic. Um, so here's some, and I'm not going to name them all for you, but you can just read, it's on the slide, um, neem oil, insecticide soap, uh, paganic, uh, cassazian. Um, but anyway, um, they're can be very uh, notorious, but fortunately we have a lot of predators out there as well. Uh, everyone's familiar with lady beetles. Uh, both the adult and the lady beetle larvae consume them. In fact, adults can eat more than 300 aphids a day. And larvae, depending on the size, 30 to 50 aphids per day. Uh, so they're voracious predators. And also the Hoover fly or surfeit fly, these are good pollinators as the adult fly, but the larval stage is also an excellent feeder of aphids, consuming 400 or more aphids during its entire development as the larvae. And then there's lacewings. We got both the green and brown lacewing, and the egg is uh, kind of unusual, laid up on a stalk. 
but the larvae looks like an alligator and they too are known to be voracious aphid predators consuming about 200 aphids per week. And then there's parasoid, parasitoids or parasitic wasps that can attack um, aphids. They lay their eggs right into the body of the aphid and then it balloons up and it kind of looks like a mummy. So that's what we call them as a mummy because they kind of turn white. Uh, and then when they're done eating out the inside of the aphid, they'll cut an end at a circular hole at the end here and the wasps will emerge and continue the cycle. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, beneficial wasps that are out there uh, killing many aphids. And then we also, when we have moist conditions, uh, we can get many diseases that attack the aphids. And if you see this on your leaf, that's good. Uh, this is one that's infected with a fungal disease and you can see the white mycelium here uh, growing from the dead aphid body. Okay, moving on to caterpillars or lepidoptera. There's many different types of caterpillars, um, but we'll be talking about true caterpillars in the lepidoptera. And this includes both moths and butterflies. And the adults are not damaging to our flower plants. They're pollinators and have siphoning mouth parts that feed on nectar and pollen. And I'm gonna talk mainly about the variegated cutworm, which is in the family Noctuidae. This one's common in our gardens. I know I've had it. Um, and then some that we wanna attract, like we want to get monarch caterpillars in. So these aren't the pests, but I'm just listening. Sometimes we don't want a, a caterpillar feeding on our plants and other times we do. We do. So in the larvae, as you can see, have large mandibles that are chewing. And here's the mature variegated cutworm larvae. It can grow to almost two inches when it's mature. And most of plant damage is caused by the larval stage. It causes mainly defoliation. You'll see holes in the leaves, skeletonization. They'll even chew holes into the buds of flowers. And they feed primarily at night in the family Noctua, which means night. And then they hide during the day. So if you're looking around, you're seeing a lot of defoliation, maybe a cut plant off. Um, it's um, probably a cutworm and it's been, you know, it's underneath the litter, look around under the mulch and you might find it. Sometimes you have to dig down an inch or two with a trowel because uh, they don't like the uh, uh, daytime and they like a little bit of moisture as well. So, but many of the ones in the gardens are called climbing cutworms because they climb up onto the plant and feed on the foliage and flowers. But many other cutworms too, like in our vegetable garden will feed on the roots or cut the stem right off. And there's quite a few different general use insecticides that are available. And also I want to point out here, we have Bacillus thuringiensis curtaceae, which is a, a bacterial insecticide. Um, it's it's uh, very effective against the young larvae. So you need to get it on in the early growth stages of the larval stage, but it does an excellent job. And again, you want to control them when they're smaller and younger because uh, they're much easier than the large mature cutworms. And I also advocate that you spray at nighttime. And again, you know, you might see this little guy up at the top here. This is a thistle caterpillar, and it looks like it would be a terrible pest. But if you're gardening for butterflies, uh, this is uh, the painted lady butterfly. So and this is what the caterpillar looks like, the spiny guy here. And they make nice little webs, webs and nest um, in the leaves. So there's a lot of biocontrol action out there as well. If you look around in the environment is white, right? We have high humidity, warm temperatures, 
We can get fungal and viral diseases and have epizootic outbreaks. And this is what happens when they get a viral uh, infection. They become just a, a blob. And here's one that's infected, but not quite as far as long as this one. And this is how the virus spreads. It goes out and drips onto other leaves that might have a caterpillar crawling on it. And this is a uh, fungal infected one here hanging down. And these two pictures down here at the bottom are infected with parasitic wasps. This one has an ectoparasitic wasp and this one has filled, its whole body is filled with cocoons of the parasitic wasps and they're getting ready to emerge. And of course, there's um, many predators, um, you know, birds, rely on our caterpillars. So that's why I encourage you not to spray um, if you don't have a lot of them. Um, and there's many other insects that also prey on caterpillars. So they're an important food source. Moving on to sawflies saw and hymenoptera, which is the wasp. Uh, again, there's many different types of sawflies, but this particular one I call has the no ways. It doesn't have the thin waist that a lot of wasps do. And the sawflies are very specific. So they usually only attack one group of plants. So like the rose sawfly or the columbine sawfly. And I'm gonna talk mainly about the columbine sawfly. So it's very tiny, you're probably not gonna see the wasps unless you're really closely inspecting the plants daily. Um, it's black and it has pale orange legs. And then here you can see the caterpillar or the immature stage. And note that these are um, pro legs are not true um, caterpillars because they have more six or more pro legs. You can see here the rest of the body's hidden there. But they get quite large, they're about a half inch long when they're mature and a beautiful green, so they blend in uh, with the foliage and a brown head. And they're usually active late spring, so you know to go out and look for them. Uh, late spring, April to June, and they feed for about two to three weeks to, to complete the larval development. And the host is just columbine. And here, this is my plant <laughs> in my garden. And you can see it's just, they just completely defoliated it. And I have a couple others that were actually worse, uh, but the chewy mouth parts will completely remove all the foliage and skeletalize it. And sometimes, you know, this is why you end up with just some of the flowers. Um, <clears throat> but I did finally was forced to spray for it. And, um, you uh, need to inspect them frequently in the spring, especially when, if you know you have them because they, they pupate in the ground here. So they'll be back next year. And uh, so you need to um, control them as soon as possible. And there's a couple things you can do. You can pick them off and put them into a container of soapy water, something like what we do with the uh, Japanese beetle. If you, uh, had came from an area or know, or know of Japanese beetles. Um, and then there is some uh, general use insecticides on the market and then also some of the biorationales. But you might think the BT insecticide would, will work that worked with the moth and butter, butterfly. Well, you don't want to kill the butterflies, but the moth caterpillars. Um, but it does not work because these are not true caterpillars because they have more than six abdominal prolegs. So it won't work on them. So don't use that. Uh, Biocontrol, and there's a lot of parasitic wasps that do attack them and then the birds also uh, love them. And they are slower acting all the parasitic wasps. It's kind of a delayed um, effect. Uh, leaf finders, diptera, flies, Agromyzidae. Uh, these are very tiny flies, and again, they're kind of hard to observe. They got multiple generations, and they'll lay their eggs in the leaves. You can see these are the egg laying sites on the leaves. 
And then the larvae will hatch. Here's some that have been pulled outside of the mine. And then they mine uh, the leaf tissue. So what you're most likely gonna see is the leaf um, tissue, but do look for these uh, overposition or egg laying sites. And again, these don't really harm the health of the plant, but they, uh, you know, it's unsightly to see these mines in the beautiful green leaves. And there's two, um, two, there's Phytomyza is the genus, and one that's common here in the Midwest is the one that causes the serpentine uh, mines and trails in the leaves, and the other one is the blotch. Uh, now, I, I have both um, where I have my columbine, so I think we have both here, but they can have up to three generations per year. So again, physical control is crushing the larvae with your fingers in the mines, or you can prune the leaves off and then the plant will refoliate and dispose of the leaves. Um, and then there is some insecticide uh, guidance here. As soon as you see those egg punctures, you need to get a spray on for the adults and the newly hatched larvae before they mine into the leaf because the insecticide control is very difficult. So we have to focus at the adult and trying to um, kill it so it doesn't lay as many eggs because the larvae are protected inside between the plant leaves. So there's some uh, sprays. I wouldn't uh, recommend a minocolprid because this is very highly toxic to bees. Uh, try to stick away from the neonicotinoid insecticides. Uh, and then there's some biorationale insecticides. So uh, you can use, again, you might need to spray more often with a biorationale insecticide, uh, but they're not as toxic to uh, bees and um, other butterflies. There is parasitoids as well that attack both the egg and larvae. Thrips, Lancinopra, they're very tiny and you usually don't see them. Um, you'll see the damage first. So they're only about an eighth of an inch. The adult has fringe wings and um, the immature has no wings and it's usually white to yellow in color. Here's an egg. And they have rasping sucking mouth parts. So they kind of rasp away at the leaf uh, green tissue and then they feed on the plant sap. Um, and they can also vector viruses, although they're not as bad as the aphids are. If you disturb them, they'll jump or the adult can also fly away. And they love flowers. Uh, roses, glads, and irises um, are their favorite. And in the leaves, you can see a couple here, but they also cause the puckering. And you can see some stippling here. Uh, here's a couple stipple points. Uh, they can also cause some stippling on the leaves, but the buds um, and the flowers don't open up and then you'll may see some discoloration. Here you can see some browning due to the thrips feeding. And this white is also caused from the thrips feeding, this discoloration here. And they do, they're worse when it's hot, dry like last year. And I have my glads on the south side of the house where it's hot and dry. And I didn't get any flowers this last year due to thrips. I, I didn't spray for them, but I just cut them off because it was too late. Um, and here's the yellow and blue uh, traps. Uh, again, there's quite a selection of insecticides um, if you're interested in using them. You can also get a uh, predator mite, Phytosia day, it's commercially available um, and you can buy that through some suppliers if you're interested. And then ending here on a uh, non-insect, a spider mite, uh, it's more closely related to a spider uh, than an insect. Uh, but we have two spotted spider mites a lot too when it's hot and dry. And they're very, very tiny, as you can see in this picture. 
most common one is the two-spotted spider mite, which has this two brown spots on the sides of the abdomen. And they're usually on the undersides of the leaf and they start to work their way up the plant from the bottom. So they'll start at the bottom leaves and then slowly work their way up. And here you can see as the name spider implies webbing, they do a lot of webbing and that's how they disperse um, and get to other plants. This is a flower head that's just covered with mites. So and they can act a lot of over 500 different hosts, um, trees, ornamentals, and crops. And they overwinter in the egg stage, usually on alfalfa and other permanent types of vegetation. Uh, here you can see the life stage. There's, they have uh, eight legs as the adult, but in the nymph stage, they only have six legs. So you could conf confuse it with an insect, which only has six legs then. But it takes five to 19 days, uh, depending on the temperature. And of course, the reproduction cycle is faster when it's hotter. And they have piercing sucking mouth parts, just like the aphids, and they feed on the little plant cells and extract the green tissue. And so it ends up looking like a bunch of stipples or stippling on the leaves. And or little white spots. And then the leaves will go yellow after that and then bronze. And then under a severe infestation, they'll just drop right off. But hopefully you won't let it get to that point. Um, and the green tissue is very important to the plants. That helps the plant makes food. So it results in the loss of photosynthetic ability and water loss in the plants. So you're gonna end up re reduced figure and small or no flowers on the plant if you have a severe mite infestation. A good way to sample for them is a white sheet of paper underneath the plant and wrap uh, with a stick and dislodge the mites onto the white sheet of paper. You'll need a hand lens to look for them. They're very slow moving on that piece of paper. You can also use what we use for aphids, that strong force of water. You'll have to do it multiple times though for mites. And then there is some uh, insecticides. I put a question mark by pyrethrins preganics because they don't generally work. Uh, it's close related to pyrethroids um, insecticides and they generally flare mites. So I'm, the label had mites on there, but I question whether it's a wise idea to use pyganic or other pyrethrins like from the chrysanthemum flower. So I'd stick with neem or insecticidal soap or spinosad. Uh, there's a lot of natural enemies, uh, minute pirate bug, lady beetle, adult and larvae, and you can commercially get these uh, predatory mites um, which will eat them. There's several different types of predatory mites. Um, it's important um, when you're sampling, you're most likely going to see these predatory mites that are out there and they have longer legs and they move much faster to catch its prey. Um, so when you're sampling with your white sheet of paper, um, you'll probably see some of these as well. And they're avail available commercially. Again, if you're going to use any insecticides, uh, you know, avoid spraying blooming plants. Um, if you can, select a more least toxic pesticide or formulation. And then spray in the evenings when the temperatures are below 55. I realize sometimes it doesn't get that cold in the evenings during the middle of summer, but Again, late evening is when they go back to the hives. Bumblebees are more active longer. Uh, use a short residual insecticide if possible. Um, and sometimes I cut my flowers off so it's not attractive at all to any pollinator if I have to spray. And here's some extension pollinator publications um, that you might be interested in. And I'm working on the insect pest of North Dakota flower gardens. Um, I keep revising it. I 
been working on it for a while now, but I keep learning new things that I want to stick into it. So <laughs> it'll be coming out this uh, May, June. And with that, I'd like to conclude and we can move to the questions. Originally, you talked about some biorational insecticides. Yep. Can they hurt pollinators? Well, <laughs> um, it depends on which one you're talking about. Um, uh, yeah, some, they're generalists. A lot of them, like neem, um, is a generalist um, insecticide. It kills a lot of different insects. Um, so if you spray it onto the flowers and a butterfly uh, comes and feeds it, you, you might not kill it, but it depends it would probably make it sick or some of them are very susceptible. So yeah, it's, it's hard to say, but yeah, any insecticide will kill a pollinator okay. um, in general, if you give it a high enough concentration and it depends if it's, you know, dried, has it dried, you know, once they dry pesticides, insecticides become much safer. But if it comes into contact with it when it's still wet or it flies through when you're spraying, um, you know, it's most likely going to dry, die, unfortunately. That's why you recommend spraying at night, right? Yes. How about the Japanese beetle? You mentioned about throw, picking them off and throwing them in soapy water. Do sticky traps work or do you have any other tips to manage Japanese beetle? Um. It's a large beetle, uh, the Japanese beetle, and it's not very common yet here in North Dakota, but we do have it. It's mainly out at the nurseries. And it's uh, the most recent survey that was done last year indicates that we have the highest population in the eastern side of the state in Grand Forks and Fargo. Um, it is out in Bismarck, though, as well, and, and might not. But um, it, yeah, it's a huge beetle. So I don't think the sticky traps would work very well uh, because they so strong, they can, the larger insects can just get on it, but they can also get off the trap. But there is a pheromone trap that you can use, but I wouldn't recommend it because the pheromone is so strong and powerful. You're actually drawing them in from the whole area um, so you're going to probably end up with more Japanese beetle than what you started with. So that's why, Jan, a Japanese beetle trap is very effective, but yeah. you should give it as a gift to your neighbor. <laughs> there you go. They'll be so happy to see all those beetles. Yeah. I think you gave them a great gift. And, <laughs> and then you'll just walk back in your home and smile. And go, Thank you for taking every beetle in the neighborhood away from us. Yeah, ho hopefully we won't end up getting them here our winters are a little more severe uh, like they have in minneapolis yeah i like that about you jane you're such an optimist about things you know but uh, how about jane how about some a negative thought here there's a comment here that are we in danger of a yellow and black spider entering the u.s that looks like that looks like a yellow and black garden spider have you heard of that um i haven't heard about that but um Usually spiders, um, you know, they come from the South America, Central America, where it's warmer. Um, and I don't think they'll do as well. Certainly they won't do well here in North Dakota if it's uh, being introduced. It depends where the spider originated from. But they may be able to survive down in uh, southern Florida and Texas. But I um, uh, thank goodness for the colder weather. You know, That's we. Right. Usually. Every time it's 25 below or 30 below, we should be yeah. thankful, right? <laughs> yes, the best that's why we don't have as many poisonous spiders here in North Dakota. Most of them hitch, hitchhike up into North Dakota and they're just temporary. How about, do you have any comments about using spinosad for insect control? Um, no, I'm I, I've used it on, um, it's probably one of the better biorational insecticides for flea beetles um, on okay. your garden crops. Um, it's a very difficult insect to control. And um, 
on your vegetables and it's very effective against some, you know, yeah. quite a few different insects. So yeah, no, it's a good, you know, I'm glad yeah. that we have it. It's based off of, uh, I don't think it's organic registered, but because it's a bacteria that has to be synthesized. It's right. not natural grain. Yeah. Came from a rum distillery in the yeah. Caribbean. Right? <laughs> How about that? It's pretty cool. Okay, let's say it, we like milkweed because it attracts the monarch. Yeah. But what if our milkweed has aphids? What can we do? Oh, yes, I had thousands on my milkweed. <laughs> 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 I yeah. just let them go. I, I like them. Um, I have a lot of beneficial insects on them, eating them. Uh, although the reproduction rate of the aphids quickly covered the whole plant. Um, and I... I it actually was um, affecting my monarch larvae. They didn't like that. So, but I didn't do anything. Um, but again, if I had them I, and I wanted to get rid of them, I'd try the wa water and probably a, a strong force of water several times. Um, and you can also, some people will take a uh, wipe, uh, like a, a hand disinfectant wipe and use that to wipe along the leaves. And if you don't have a lot of plants, you could do okay. something like that. Jan, how come you didn't, there's a question here. How come for those aphids, you didn't buy a crate of ladybugs to eat them? <laughs> well, part of the problems with buying some of the uh, commercially available lady beetles and so forth is once you release, the, uh, release them, their tendency is to disperse and not stay where you put them. So that's part of the problem. Uh, they work well in greenhouses where they're, you know, contained in a contained environment where they can't get out. But um, in the garden setting, uh, a lot of the beneficials will um, move out of your garden, even if there is host, because that's what they're Ten, their nature their, tells them to do. Okay. How about, can I use neem or insecticidal soap too often? Can you hurt the plants by spraying them too much? Uh, yes, it can be a little, it depends on the formulation, but it can be, I did some work um, when I was in Maryland at the USDA ARS. In fact, I did some of the work that uh, got it registered as an insecticide. <laughs> Okay. Um, so it was before it was even registered, but yeah, we tried some really high rates on chrysanthemum and we did see some phytotoxic burn, um, especially if you spray it and there's a real strong sunshine or okay. it's really hot. Okay. We talked earlier about, uh, using water against, uh, aphids. How about like water against mites? Like in either case, when you knock them down with a jet spray of water, do they just like, shake off the water and climb back up or I know uh, it it has to be um hard enough to actually physically wash them off the plant and then they usually end up drowning on the ground okay that's good news yeah about uh this person gets aphids or mites that they notice when they bring their outdoor plants inside in the late fall. Do you have any solutions where we can do that? Into the house? Yeah, like, you know, like, let's see, you got some house plants out in the deck, and then you bring them inside, and then you notice there's aphids or mites on them. Yeah, in that case, it's okay to use a soil drench with the metacloprid, the neonicotinoid, because mm. you're not going to have any bees buzzing around in the house or butterflies. So, um, you'd be okay to use one of the soil drenches, or you could use any of the um, synthetic insecticides or the biorationales, uh, whichever yeah. you pr prefer. But the systemic, the neonicotinoids are systemic, so they're taken up by the roots of the plant and translocated throughout the leaves. And then when the aphids or mites um, feed on the plant juices, they'll imbibe the insecticide and die eventually. Okay, this person has issues with wasps in the fall, and they're worried about killing the wasps with chemicals because they don't want to harm the bees. 
What do you do? You have any okay, recommendations I, I, for them? They're probably hornets. I assume. Well, yeah, sure, or yellow jackets. Yellow jackets, yeah. Um, yeah, they're hornets. especially if they're close to the house, they can be dangerous. If you have somebody who's allergic to the stings, uh, so it's good to get rid of them. Um, um, usually, they're nest in very small areas like under a porch or in between the walls in your house so there you would you spray in the late evening and I often recommend a professional because um they can sting and repeatedly sting you they're not like a honeybee stinger uh so you don't want to you know have them stinging you um so I you can get rid of them because they're really not near flowers. So where you're spraying is usually into the ground. They, they are ground nesters as well. They'll go underneath your uh, patio. If there's uh, no stone there, they might get underneath there and build a nest into the ground or if they could be in the siding of your house or I've had some get into chimneys even. <laughs> Got a few calls, so they can get anywhere. But I had them in the siding of my house, um, and I had I tried spraying, but I the problem with the sprayers homeowners have they don't have enough force to get it all the way up where the nest is because you need to kill the queen um, of the nest to be successful in removing all the wasps. So we're just going to wind this up really quickly here. Just some quick answers. So this peonies, they have damage on the leaves. It looks like oh. they were cut with serrated scissors. Oh, yeah. The, there's a weevil that does that on the peonies. And there's leaf cutter bees as well. Uh, so you'd have to see which one you have. Um, the weevil the, does actually does some damage to the roots and feeds on the roots. Uh, but the, the adult just makes the funny cuts on the peonies. But it could be leaf cutter bees as well. They nest in the tubes. If you put out the houses in the bee hotels, um, they'll bring back uh, little leaves, half moon shape. Okay, so, you know, I'm uh, just gonna answer a couple questions like, uh, there is a fan of that Be Beautiful publication that you have and they want to know how to get a copy. You can just go online. No problem with that. And uh, how about one last question? Is the milkweed tussock moth larvae detrimental to the monarch larvae? Yes, I had that as well on my milkweed and they did move my, uh, I ended up, taken the monarch larvae and I moved it myself to one that wasn't infested with the uh, tussock moth. Cause yeah, they do compete for the same resource. And I, from what I saw, the tussock moths will outcompete the monarch larvae. Okay, well, thank you. Jan, thank you for all the great tips. Mm -hmm.